guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and I'm here today with Henry. Hello. And today is our next Vice Presidential Series installment, and we're taking a look at what number, Henry? The 22nd Vice President of the United States, Levi P. Warren. Very good, he's right. The 22nd Vice President of the United States, the older looking man behind he's us, Le <laughs> yeah, Levi P. Morton. Some cool things to tell you about Levi P. Morton. He was the vice president under who, Henry? Benjamin Harrison. That's right, Benjamin Harrison. Very good. So we're going to get into all the cool things that we got to tell you about Levi P. Morton. But first, before we do that, what do the people need to do, Henry? Hit subscribe down below. Leave all your comments and questions. Give us a thumbs up and hit that notification. <laughs> there you go. Great job, dude. So, yes. Leave uh, comments and questions down below. Hit the subscribe button, of course. Uh, you go give us a like, thumbs up. I'm stumbling too here, you know what I mean? <laughs> and of course, notification bell, right? Yeah. So you can be notified when we do release a new video. Because Henry, tell the people, when is that? Every single week. Every single week, he's right. So here we go. Our next Vice Presidential Series installment, taking a look at the 22nd Vice President of the United States, Levi P. Morton. And this is Dead History. Dead History. Hey guys, TJ back with you here with Henry. Hello. And yes, the guy behind us is the 22nd Vice President of the United States. Who, Henry? Levi P. Morton. Levi P. Morton. Yeah, and he was Vice President under... Benjamin Harrison. Benjamin Harrison, as we said a little bit ago. Yep. So yes, he was vice president under Benjamin Harrison, who of course was president in between Grover Cleveland's first and second, second. term. Yeah. Yes, he was that the, the middle guy there, basically. Oh. Cool things to tell you about Levi P. Morton, such as, of course, he was vice president. He was also governor of... A New York. The, uh, I was, 31st... Um, Governor of New York. Was he really? Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. I'm I'm not kidding, guys. I don't even know that. The 31st governor of New York? Mm -hmm. Would you see that on the page I had up? Yeah. I don't even know if he's right, but if he's right, that's an awesome job. Henry says he's the 31st governor of the state of New York, but either way, he definitely was the governor of New York. So pretty cool stuff. Another cool thing about Levi P. Morton, where do you get this? He lived until he was the age of... Take a guess, Henry. How old was he when he died? 98. You're really close. He was 96. He was 96 okay. years old when he died. But do you guys want to hear something even more crazy? What? You would think that's the oldest living vice president ever, right? You would think that. I mean, yeah. But there actually was a vice president that lived to be 98. And we're going to tell you all about that later on in our Vice Presidential Series. So yeah, Levi P. Morton did live till he was 96, but he actually was the second longest living Vice President. Yeah, not the first. You would think the first, but he wasn't. That's crazy, right? Yeah. Pretty crazy stuff. So all right, a lot of cool things to tell you. Here we go. Next Vice Presidential Series installment. They did the subscribes. They did the likes. They did the comments, questions, notification about all of it. Mm -hmm. Henry, what do they got to go get? Go get the popcorn, the pretzels, the potato chips, the gummy bears, anything you want. Anything, right? Yeah, anything. Anything to stack up. Or like Henry and I just had, the Jelly Belly Jelly Bean game where you don't, what is it called, like bamboozled, where you don't know what the flavor is, and mm -hmm. some of them are nasty, right? Yeah. What did you get, Henry? I got... Dirty dishwater. He got dead fish. Dead fish. Oh, disgusting, but fun, right? There you go. Go grab all those snacks, because here we go. Our next Vice Presidential Series installment, the 22nd Vice President of the United States, Levi P. Morton. Sit back, relax... And enjoy. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History. And welcome to our next Vice Presidential Series installment as we're taking a look today at our 22nd Vice President of the United States, Levi Parsons Morton. That's right, Levi P. Morton 
is our next vice president that we are going to be covering, of course, the 22nd vice president. Uh, I am flying solo, of course, for the audio. Uh, Henry is not with me. Um, Just uh, one quick thing I wanted to mention before jumping into Levi P. Morton. Uh, Unfortunately, well, I shouldn't say that. Let Let me rephrase that. Uh, fortunately, actually, uh, I started, uh, you know, a new job, uh, a little over a week ago. Um, so, you know, my time right now is a little limited as far as being able to drive around and go to different places for bonus footage. Uh, so I do want to apologize to you guys because I know you guys love, uh, some, you know, extra fun bonus footage. There will still be bonus footage. You know, I've, I've seen all the grave sites, so you will see all of that, of course. Uh, but somebody like, for example, Levi P. Morton, who we're doing uh, now, today, uh, and tomorrow, uh, he, was, he was a New York guy. I mean, he lived in New York, he's buried in New York, and he died in New York. Now, not New York City. That's only about an hour from me. Uh, he died in Rhinebeck, New York, and lived in Rhinebeck, New York, which is about two and a half hours or so one way from me. So uh, it's more upstate New York. So, um, you know, you just have to keep in mind, if I had the time, I would go see some of this stuff again and bring you some extra bonus footage, but uh, I just don't have the time currently. So I apologize for that, uh, but I did want to address that so you guys don't think I'm uh, just getting lazy and, uh, you know, deciding not to do that kind of stuff for you because I do love it. I will say there is a vice president coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, I think in about three weeks from now, uh, that there is definitely Garrett Hobart is who I'm referring to. He was a New Jersey guy. There's definitely going to be bonus footage for him. So uh, just keep staying tuned and keep tuning in. So, um, all right. So that's that. Now let's jump right in to our 22nd Vice President of the United States, Levi P. Morton. Business experience had taught him conservatism. He never was influenced by crazy theorists. Senator Thomas C. Platt. Like a hero from the pages of a Horatio Alger novel, Levi P. Morton worked his way up by pluck and luck to fame and fortune. From a boy toiling in a country store, he rose to become one of the nation's wealthiest and most influential bankers and vice president of the United States. Morton might have become president as well had his political acumen matched his financial ability. Youth Born on May 16th of 1824 in the little village of Shoreham, Vermont, Levi Parsons Morton was named for his uncle, the first American missionary to Palestine. He was the son of a congregational preacher who moved his family from church to church in New England, never accruing much wealth. Although young Morton wanted to attend college, his father was too poor to send him. An older brother advised him not to worry about further schooling since a self-taught man is worth two of your college boys. Instead, Morton took a job in a country store. After getting his fill of heavy manual labor, he sought respite as a teacher in a country school. Then he took another clerkship in the general store of W.W. Estabrook in Concord, New Hampshire, where he learned the bookkeeper's art of calculating profit and loss. Estabrook dispatched Morton to run his store in Hanover, New Hampshire. There, the young Morton lived with the family of a Dartmouth College professor and met Lucy Young Kimball whom he would eventually marry 13 years later. But first, he had a fortune to earn. Morton later recalled that he was happiest when I was learning how to accomplish things when I was building up my business. When his employer went bankrupt, the chief creditor 
James M. Beebe came to New Hampshire to inspect the situation and was impressed enough with Morton's industriousness to invite him to join James M. Beebe and Company in Boston, the business mecca for every Yankee boy. Beebe and Company, Boston's largest importing firm, soon took, soon took Junius Spencer Morgan as a partner, thus introducing Levi Morton to Morgan's son, J.P. Morgan, who would one day become his principal rival as a banker. In 1854, B.B. sent Morton to New York City to take charge of the company's operations there. A year later, Morton formed his own dry goods company in New York. Finally wealthy and secure enough to settle down, he married Lucy Kimball in 1856. The new Mrs. Morton disliked his Old Testament name of Levi and began calling her husband L.P., as he became known among family and friends thereafter. Banking and Politics Morton's chief business was importing cotton from the South for New England's textile industry and exporting manufactured goods from the North to the agricultural South. When the Civil War broke out in the spring of 1861, his loss of Southern clients forced him to suspend business. For the next decade, Morton worked to pay back his own creditors dollar for dollar. Although the war soon stimulated the northern economy and rebuilt Morton's financial base, he saw a safer and more profitable future in banking. In 1863, he founded a Wall Street banking house, later named Morton Bliss and Company with a London firm called Morton Rose. Wait, call yeah, a London firm called Morton and Rose. By the end of the war, Morton's bank could challenge the powerful J. Cook and Company for the right to handle government transactions. In 1873, Cook's bank failed leaving Morton as one of the preeminent bankers in the nation. Morton's gracious manners and generous campaign contributions made him many friends in Washington. Among them, President Ulysses S. Grant and Grant's strongest supporter in Congress, Senator Roscoe Conkling of New York. Morton and his British partner, Sir John Rose expanded their financial and political fortunes by facilitating U.S. negotiations with Great Britain to settle the Alabama claims. During the war, Britain had violated its neutrality by allowing the construction of Confederate shipping on its soil. Senator Charles Sumner, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, pressed the administration to demand large-scale compensation from Britain, including the annexation of Canada, even if those claims led the two nations to war. Morton and Rose persuaded the British and Americans to accept international arbitration of their war claims, the U.S. to reduce its demands, and the British to pay $15 million in damages for which the House of Morton and Rose acted as dispersing office. When advised that the government's position would be strengthened by using Morton and Rose as its agent, President Ulysses Grant questioned whether Morton's firm was strong because of the government's patronage rather than the other way around. After his wife, Lucy, died in 1871, L.P. Morton married Anna Livingston Reed Street in 1873. Anna's connections as a member of New York's old Knickerbocker Society helped propel Morton 
into New York's political scene. From all accounts, Anna Morton combined great charm, wisdom, and prudence, making her admirably suited to be the wife of a political man. In 1876, Morton became financial chairman of the Republican National Committee. Aware that success in this position might reward him with an attractive diplomatic post, he was also considering a race for Congress. Morton asked his friend, White Law Reed, editor of the New York Tribune, if elected and I wanted a foreign mission, could I well resign and accept that? Or if defeated, what then? Adding, I have never made a speech in my life. Reed encouraged him not to worry about speech making, but advised that a resignation from a newly won office would create some bitterness. When Morton declared his candidacy for a house seat from New York's 11th district, a fashionable residential area around Upper Fifth Avenue, he ran on a platform of sound currency based on the gold standard. That plank would remain consistent through his next quarter century in politics. His opponents pictured him as a plutocrat and a tool of Wall Street, charges that would similarly, similarly follow him in every election. Morton lost by a narrow margin, but won when he ran again for the seat in 1878. The Conkling Machine. In politics, Morton identified himself with the New York political faction, the Stalwarts, headed by Republican Senator Roscoe Conkling. Opposing the Stalwarts were the half-breed Republicans who rallied behind Senator James G. Blaine of Maine. Conkling and Blaine were bitter and political rivals, yet few substantive differences existed between their rival factions on the issues of the day. Conkling's machine was more identified with New York's financial interests and made sound currency its chief legislative aim, while the half-breeds placed more emphasis on railroads, industry, and the protective tariff. Both organizations, however, thrived on government patronage and opposed civil service reform. Morton's presence in the Conkling machine attested to its connections with Wall Street financiers. Entering Congress in 1879, Morton acted as much as a representative of Morton, Bliss, and Company as he did as a representative of the 11th District, since he saw no difference between his own interests and those of his constituents. The newspaper reporter George Alfred Townsend described Morton as not a loquacious man and yet an interesting talker and one of the pleasantest expressions of his face is that of the respectful, intelligent listener. He stood six feet tall, straight-limbed and erect, and walked with flexible and quiet movements. With close cropped hair and a square jaw, his face had a cosmopolitan appearance, though the New England lines are decided. The whole tone of his talk and character are toward tranquility, Townsend observed. In the house, Morton was a close listener, a silent critic, a genial answerer, neither intrusive nor obtrusive. Since Morton was wealthier than his colleagues, he was able to establish his family in a handsome house on Lafayette Square that became a popular meeting place for politicos and high society. 
Morton won a reputation for hers for his urbanity and generous hospitality. Among the friends he made was Representative James Garfield of Ohio, declining the vice presidency. In 1880, Morton went to the Republican convention as a Conkling lieutenant dedicated to winning a third term nomination for Ulysses S. Grant. Conkling's stalwarts were equally determined to stop the nomination of Blaine. When a deadlock developed, Blaine's half-breeds threw their support to Garfield, a dark horse candidate. Once Garfield won the nomination, he realized that he would need a New Yorker on the ticket and immediately thought of his wealthy and well-positioned friend, L.P. Morton. Morton scurried to find Conkling, who objected. When Morton declined the offer, the vice presidential nomination went instead to another Conkling man, Chester A. Arthur, who had fewer scruples about breaking with the boss. Still trying to make peace with the Conkling faction, Garfield came to New York in August of 1880 for a meeting in Morton's suite at the Fifth Avenue Hotel. There, Garfield promised to support the Conkling Machine's patronage demands, which included the post of Secretary of the Treasury. The Treasury Department oversaw the New York Custom House, upon whose patronage the New York Machine had been built. Morton agreed to chair Garfield's campaign finance committee, assuming that the treasury portfolio would be his. After winning the election, however, Garfield insisted that he had made no specific pledges. In December of 1880, Garfield recorded in his diary that Morton was under misapprehension that he had been promised the Treasury Department. This was not my understanding and seems wholly inadmissible. It would be a congestion of financial power at the money center and would create jealousy at the West. Blaine, who had been named Secretary of State, pronounced Morton unfit for the Treasury, while Senator Conkling traveled to Garfield's home in Mentor, Ohio, to lobby for Morton. Conkling wanted to balance Blaine in the cabinet to protect his organization's control over the New York Custom House and to remove Morton from a hotly contested race for the other Senate seat from New York, which Conkling wanted for Tom Platt. Haughtily, Conkling told the president-elect that New York would rather be passed over completely in the cabinet if it could not obtain the Treasury Department. Even Garfield's wife, Lucretia, joined the fray when she wrote from a New York shopping trip, Mr. Whitelaw Reed told me this morning that Morton had been very ugly in his talk about you using the expression that seems to be so gratifying to the Conkling click, that Ohio man cannot be relied upon to stand by his pledges. Shortly before the inauguration, Garfield offered Morton the secretaryship of the Navy, which he accepted. But Conkling and Arthur roused, roused Morton from his bed in the middle of the night and persuaded him to decline the post. The next day, Garfield recorded, Morton broke down on my hands under the pressure of his New York friends who called him out of bed at four this morning to prevent his taking the Navy Department. The New York delegation are in a great row because I do not give the treasury to that state. Despite his exasperation, Garfield still owed Morton something 
for his work as campaign finance chairman and settled on making him minister to France. Collapse of the Conkling machine. As president, James Garfield confronted the Conkling machine by appointing the half-breed Republican William Robertson to be collector of the Port of New York and head of the Custom House. His action triggered a series of events that culminated in the resignations of Senators Conkling and Platt, who expected to be reelected by the New York legislature as a show of support. Instead, both were defeated. In the midst of this monumental struggle on July 2nd of 1881, President Garfield was shot by a deranged follower of Conkling stalwarts. On July 20th, when Morton sailed for France, Garfield was still lingering and recovery seemed possible. But on September 19th, the president died, making Chester Arthur and not L.P. Morton president of the United States. Morton spent the next four years in the diplomatic service, attending largely to the ceremonies connected with France's gift of the Statue of Liberty to the United States. But he still harbored ambitions for a seat in the Senate. By the time Morton returned to the United States, Roscoe Conkling had quit politics for a lucrative law practice and Tom Platt had picked up Conkling's leadership of the New York Party. In 1884, Platt decided to support Blaine for president on the grounds that Chet Arthur had deserted his former friends. Morton followed the Platt machine into the Blaine camp. He was one of the 200 businessmen who attended the infamous Millionaire's Dinner given in Blaine's honor at Delmonico's restaurant on October 29th of 1884. At that dinner, a Protestant minister rose to denounce the Democrats as the party of rum, Romanism, and rebellion. Blaine ignored the remark, but Democrats seized upon it and publicized it widely among Irish voters. Blaine lost New York by a narrow margin and with it, the presidency. Platt put Morton forward unsuccessfully for senator in 1885 and 1887. In the former instance, Morton was perceived as the frontrunner having greater resources and the full backing of Platt's machine. But Platt's men had made the mistake of taking all the key committee posts in the state assembly, causing the soreheads who had been left out to unite behind another candidate who snatched away the coveted Senate seat. The 1887 election was a three-man race in which another candidate appeared to have a better chance of winning for the stalwarts. Morton's withdrawal from the race, seen as an expression of his selfless sense of duty to his party or faction of the party, raised his chances for the vice presidential nomination in 1888. So there you go, guys. There you have it. Levi P. Morton or L.P. Morton. Uh, as he was known f by friends and family. Uh, that's kind of his early life. Uh, I'm going to read you a little bit more about his early life here. Uh, Morton was born in Shoreham, Vermont, one of six children born to the Reverend Daniel Oliver Morton, a congregational minister, and Lucretia Parsons. Morton was of entirely English ancestry. All of his immigrant ancestors came to North America from England during the Puritan migration to New England. His paternal ancestors included Captain Nathaniel Morton of Plymouth Colony. Morton was named for his mother's brother, Reverend Levi Parsons, a clergyman 
who was also the first U.S. missionary to work in Palestine. His older brother, Daniel Oliver Morton, served as the mayor of Toledo, Ohio. His younger sister, Mary Morton, was married to William F. F. Grinnell and was the mother of William Morton Grinnell, who served as the third assistant secretary of state while Morton was vice president. Morton's family moved to Springfield, Vermont in 1832 when his father became the minister of the Congregational Church there. Reverend Morton headed the congregation during the construction of the brick colonial revival style church on Main Street that is still in use. Levi Morton was considered by his Springfield peers to be a leader in all affairs in which schoolboys usually engage. The Morton family later moved to Winchenden, Massachusetts. Uh, Winchenden, Winchenden, W-I-N-C-H-E-N-D-O-N. Is it Winchenden or Winchenden? Not sure how it's pronounced. Uh, where Reverend Morton continued to serve as a church pastor. In 1838, Levi Morton graduated from the academy in Shoreham, Vermont. And of course, you know, as we had touched on, Morton was a businessman. Uh, you know, he began working uh, as a general store clerk in Enfield, Massachusetts. Uh, he taught school in Boscoin, New Hampshire, and engaged in mercantile pursuits in Hanover, New Hampshire, then moved to Boston to work in the BBN company importing business. Uh, of course, he eventually settled in New York City. And then we know about that, the Morton Bliss and Company. Um, you know, he, he did a lot of stuff with banking and business and that sort of thing. Uh, he was a Republican activist. He was active in politics as a Republican. In 1876, Morton was named finance chairman to the Republican National Committee. Uh, he was a civic leader. Morton was involved in many civic and charitable causes. In 1883, he was one of the founders of the Metropolitan Opera. In 1886, he was appointed to the Hobart College Board of Trustees. He served for several years, including a term as chairman of the board. He also served on the board of trustees of the American Museum of Natu Natural History. Then, of course, as we said, he was a member of Congress. He identified with the stalwart faction of Republicans led by Roscoe Conkling. In 1878, Morton was elected to represent Manhattan in the 46th Congress. He was re-elected to the 47th Congress in 1880, and he served from March 4th of 1879 until his resignation on March 21st of 1881. During Morton's House tenure, he served as a member of the Foreign Relations Committee and on the currency issue, which dominated discussions of U.S. economic policy for several decades, Morton consistently advocated for the gold standard. The 1880 Republican National Convention was dominated by half-breed supporters of James G. Blaine and stalwart supporters of Ulysses S. Grant for presidential nomination. As we know, James Garfield, he won. Um, we know all that. Then, of course, Garfield appointed Morton minister to France. Uh, so we know all that. Uh, Morton was very popular in France. He helped commercial relations between the two countries run smoothly during his term. And in Paris on October 24th of 1881, he placed the first rivet in the construction of the Statue of Liberty. After completion of the statue... He accepted it on behalf of the United States in a ceremony on July 4th of 1884 when he signed an agreement with the Union Franco-Americaine, the organization formed in France to finance the creation of the statue. And then, of course, as we know, he was a U.S. Senate candidate. After returning to the U.S., Morton was a candidate for the U.S. Senate in 1885. He lost the Republican nomination to William M. Everts, who went on to win election by the full New York State Legislature. He was again a candidate in 1887, 
Republicans controlled the legislature, meaning their nominee would win the election. Incumbent Warner Miller was recognized as a member of the half-breed faction and had succeeded state Republican boss Thomas C. Platt in the Senate. Platt had succeeded Conkling as leader of the stalwarts and was determined to see Miller defeated, so he backed Morton against Miller. A third candidate, Frank Hiscock, was not affiliated with either faction and had little initial support. And after 17 ballots failed to produce a nominee, Morton withdrew and asked his supporters to back his cock to ensure that Miller would not be reelected. His cock was chosen on the 18th ballot and won the election by defeating Democrat Smith Mead Weed. That's a new, I'll tell you some interesting names in this one. Uh, his cock and Democrat Smith Mead Weed. Sounds like something from Dr. Seuss. Uh, pretty, pretty funny stuff. So just a quick uh, little thing about his personal life. On October 15th of 1856, Morton married Lucy Young Kimball, the daughter of Elijah Huntington Kimball and Sarah Wetmore Hinsdale in Flatlands, Brooklyn. They had one child, daughter Carrie, who died in infancy in 1857. And then, of course, after his first wife's death in 1871, Morton married Anna Livingston Reed Street in 1873. They were the parents of five daughters and a son who died in infancy. Uh, The daughters were Edith Livingston Morton, uh, Lena Kearney Morton, Helen uh, Stuvesant Morton, Louis Parsons Morton, Alice Morton and Mary Morton. Uh, in 1902, Alice Morton founded Holiday Farm as a convalescent home for children. Children who attended were picked up at Grand Central Station and brought to the farm in Rhinebeck. Train fare, board, and clothing were provided free. In 1917, Vincent Astor served as president with Helen Dinsmore Huntington as secretary. Terry. Holiday Farm later developed into the Astor Home for Children. Pretty cool. So there you go. Uh, That's pretty much the early life, uh, the early political life, and rise to the vice presidency of Levi Parsons Morton, better known as L.P. Morton, our 22nd vice president of the United States. Uh, Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for all the support. Please keep those comments and questions coming. Um, And of course, tomorrow for part two, we will take a look at the vice presidency, legacy, death, and gravesite of Levi P. Morton. So stay tuned. No bonus footage here for part one. Part two, there will be some. So stay tuned tomorrow for part two. We will see you then. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.